shall we rise up to pray Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the calling you've given us. We thank you for the place you prepared for every one of us in heaven. We pray, Lord, we'll not miss that place in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we have searched the race before us, in your strength and your power, by your grace and enablement, we will run. In the strength of the Lord, we will run. With your grace, the all-sufficient grace, we will run this race. None of us will fall by the wayside. Your grace, your power, your strength will not fail any of us. There's no challenge that will ever come before any of us that your power will not make us stand. We will stand. We will walk. We will run. We will serve you to the very end. And I pray, Lord, that everyone serving you faithfully, both in this retreat from the beginning until this very end, and then for the rest of our lives, every day the reward of service will be for everyone in Jesus' name. If the people of the world who are serving the devil are happy in a way, those who are serving the Lord shall be happy. Make your people happy. Make your people healthy. And make them to have joy in serving you in Jesus' name. That all the joy you give us will be an impetus inside us to keep on serving you to the very end. Once again, bless your people today. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. you. Can see that we're coming to Luke chapter twelve. Luke chapter twelve. I'm reading from verse thirty-two. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Lord is reassuring us here that there is nothing for us to fear and he says fear not little flock it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom he'll give you the kingdom in second timothy chapter four second timothy chapter four we're reading from verse 18 second timothy chapter four verse 18 and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To him the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As we're on the race that the Lord has set before us, he's giving us assurance. He'll keep us from every evil. He'll keep us from every danger. He'll keep us from anything that will weaken us and stop our journey until the very end in Jesus' name. Fear not, run the race to reach the goal. Run the race to reach the goal. It means to look at the path before you. It means to look at the way he has outlined before you. And you are running that race and you're keeping to the track and your eyes are set on the goal, on the destiny of a real child of God. And until you reach the goal, you know you cannot stop. You must continue until you reach the goal. And the goal is to get to heaven. The goal is to be in that kingdom that he has appointed for us. And you never move your mind or move your eyes from that fixed goal. And you keep on running a step at a time, a day at a time, until you reach that goal. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, running without the fears and the filthiness in our society. Running without the fears and the filthiness in our society number two reaping the fields and gathering fruits for the savior 
reaping the fields and gathering fruits for the Savior. Number three, reaching forth towards the fullness of his stature. Reaching forth towards the fullness of his stature. Number one is running the race. Running that race without the fears and the filthiness of a society. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that she may obtain. So run that you may obtain. The people who run the race, they have to get rid of all encumbrance, of all things that may attach themselves unto them, so that they were run freely, and they were run fully, and they were run with focus. They were run with all their attention fixed on the goal, fixed on the race they're running. If they have any pain or any pebble in their shoe, it will disturb them. If they have anything on their back, it will disturb them. If they have anything that is weighing down their mind, it will affect them. Therefore, they have to get rid of all the fears, get rid of all the things that may combat their lives, and they run the race freely. And then he goes on to say every man in verse 25 that strive it for the mastery is temperate in all things everyone that strives to get to the goal that strives for the mastery that wants to win the prize it says he is temperate in all things self-controlled in all things mind controlled in all things and bodily controlled in all things he puts everything on the check he puts everything under control, temperate in all things. He looks at every area of his life. His speech, he looks at that. His communication, he looks at that. Companionship, he looks at that. And the place of work, he looks at that. He sets the goal before him every time. And anything in his disposition, anything in his personal life, anything that will hinder him from running freely and running fully to the end, he wants to be temperate in all things and he gets rid of those things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. It's talking about the athletes in the world, what they do. They do that to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run. You know, make it personal. And you have to make it personal in your life that you so run. I therefore so run. You wake up in the morning, you say, This day is part of the time the Lord has given me to run the race. I therefore so run, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body. I keep under every part of my body every part of my desires, every part of what may want to come in as inordinate affection. It says I keep under my body and I bring it to subjection. I don't allow my tongue to control me. I bring it under subjection. I don't allow my eyes to just see whatever it wants to see. I bring it under subjection. My hands, I bring that under uh, subjection. And my feet, they cannot just go anywhere they want to go. I put that under subjection. It's a subjection less by any means. When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul the Apostle said, I'm thinking about my life. And you know he met the Lord on the way to Damascus. And he had the voice of the Lord directly. His conversion was spectacular. And he could tell you how spectacular the conversion was. And yet he said, I never forget this fact. There is the possibility of still being a castaway. Here is the person that went to the third heavens and he had things he couldn't relate to people. He said, with all the revelations of God and with all the mysteries I understand and with all the vision of the glory of heaven, of the coming kingdom that I've seen, I still put my body 
under subjection. I bring it into subjection. Less after I have prayed to others, I have served others, I have brought others into the kingdom, I myself should be a castaway. Paul the Apostle was always thinking of that. He never thought of eternal security for anyone or for himself. He never behaved as if I've gone beyond instruction. I've gone beyond prayer. I've gone beyond submitting myself to the word of God. I've gone beyond listening to the word of God and walking in the way of the Lord. He never thought I'm totally and eternally secured. Whatever I do and I'm a person, whatever I do, I'm so great. Whatever I do, look at the fruit of my labor. As you read the Romans, the Corinthians, and Galatians, and all those epistles, how can I fall? I've gone to the place where I'm not so sacred and untouchable. He said, no, I'm still keeping my body under, and I'm conscious of the fact that after I've done so much, I, I might be a castaway. And because of that, he was running with understanding, the understanding of Scripture. The Lord is telling us in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, a cloud of witnesses like Moses, a cloud of witnesses we see in David, a cloud of witnesses we see in Solomon, a cloud of witnesses we see in Samson, a cloud of witnesses we see in Saul, a cloud of witnesses we see in Judas Iscariot, were compassed about with a cloud of witnesses of the people that started, of the people that were running, and they were not free from the filthiness of society. They were not free from the fears of society. You think about uh, all these people who have mentioned this cloud of witnesses, and you want to be conscious that if it happened to something, it could happen to you. If it happened to Solomon, it could happen to you. If it happened to David, it could happen to you. And that's, what Paul the, that's why Paul the Apostle said, I run, not as uncertainly, and not as one beating the air, but I am running, and then I'm looking at the goal, and I'm making sure that I keep my body under. I keep everything under my control so that less after I pray to others, I myself should be a castaway. Wherefore, seeing also, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. You are the one to determine for yourself what's that weight that will pull you back, the weight that will pull you down. The things that will make you to slow down and the things will do, guilt will come, condemnation will come, and guilt is a heavy stone. That guilt will not allow you to run the way you ought to run. And it says that kind of weight that will debar you from making speed and running the way you ought to run. That kind of weight that will hold you back and hold you down. It says, lay it aside. Now, you might have laid it with some weights aside before, but every new day may bring a new challenge. Every new season may bring a new challenge. And it's saying that whatever the state and whatever the time and whatever uh, the period, the season in which we live, and society is thinking about this, society is thinking about that, all those weights in society that will pull you back and tie you down, lay aside every weight. Now, you cannot do that unconsciously. You have to do that consciously. When you are taking up a weight, that thing is heavy, and you're pushing it aside, or you are taking it to another place where it will not bother you, or where you will not stumble because of it, it takes some determination. It takes some dedication. It takes some definite effort on your part. It's not something that, okay, all those weights will go. No, you have to take them up. 
you have to lift them up and you have to throw them aside and forget them let us lay aside every weight and the sin we do so easily beset us there are many people that are watching over the lives of other people they are not watching over their own lives they don't close the door against the sin that may make them trip against the sin that will make them fall against the sin that will become an imposing terrible temptation unto them they cannot overcome it says you lay aside the sin that does so easily beset you and then after that let us run with patience the race that is set before us it says you leave this weight aside first don't say i'm running i'm running and then the weights in your life you have not laid aside and the sin that does so easily beset you you have not laid aside i want to ask you during this retreat in all the messages we have heard and as you express your heart and your life unto the lord which weight have you laid aside think about that have we gone through the retreat and you know that this weight will hold you down, pin you down, tie you up, and you'll not be able to make progress, and yet you've not laid any weight aside. You've not taken a decision, and you've not made up your mind, you've not determined this weight that is having the tendency of pinning me down, pulling me down, drawing me back, I lay it aside. If you have not done that, think about your life, even now, and say, what's going to stop me? What's going to retouch my journey? What's going to slow me down? And the sin will do so easily beset you. What sin is it that will not make you live victoriously? That is always coming. And somebody will think about a particular sin which they always think about and it may not be that it may just be it is this peculiar thing in your life it's become a habit it's become part of the character it's become part of the regular things that takes place and if that is so the Lord is saying that's the sin that doesn't really beset you lay it aside so that at least you will see a remarkable change and difference between every between this day and the previous days and then you run with patience with perseverance the race that is set before you look at verse 2 looking unto Jesus when you look away from Jesus you fail you fall somebody is running a race and it's not looking in front of him it's looking here looking here looking back you're not going to be able to run the race if you are not looking onto Jesus there are people that will want to attract our attention look unto us look on us the people that will want to shift your focus away from Christ, look on us. The people that will want to turn you away from your Savior, they say, yes, love your Savior, love me too. They say, obey your Savior, obey me too. They say, run after your Savior, run after me too. And they want to focus your heart, your attention upon themselves. They're looking for slaves. They're looking for people they can tie the rope in their leg and then be pulling them along. They're looking for robots. They're looking for people that are not having a mind to think, a mind to follow, a mind to know, here is my calling, here is where God has called me, and here is what he calls me to do, and he wants you to look unto them. If you're going to run the race, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, he is the author of our faith and he is the only one that will be the perfecter that will be the finisher of our faith the faith that christ has given and originally you rose up for a following after the lord he started it he authorized it he originated it he created it he gave it to you as a gift at the beginning and he is the only one that will be the finisher and the perfecter of your faith and so if you have a hero in your heart a religious hero 
if you have a hero in your heart a hero in the world and you're always looking at them always looking at them they cannot perfect your faith they will not be the finisher of your faith it says you look unto jesus he is the author and he is the finisher of your faith look i've been talking about shall be giving you my testimony how I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and how by the grace of God I've been running the race and running the race and I'm keeping my eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. You must understand in 50 years or more, about 54 years, more than that now, I would have seen personalities, I would have seen heroes, I've seen this and that and I've seen them all over the world in that continent, that continent, and that continent and there are people that will say, you know here is where we are here is what we're doing here is what we believe and then they want me to be looking onto them as the people that i will finish with it cannot be i know the author of my faith and i know the finisher of my faith and i look away from all of them they invite they write they talk they try to convince i say no I have chosen the right way and this is the way to go Jesus is my savior he is my sanctifier he is my healer he is my baptizer and he is my coming king I don't only sing it I believe it I don't only sing it I stand on it I don't only sing it I follow him looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith you have to make up your mind like that that nothing will shift your focus give me a good day. amen and it comes with a decision a decision as definite as your salvation that you kneel down and you say Lord today even though I know I'm saved I know I'm a child of God I'm taking a decision I will always look at you I will always look unto you I will always take you as the finisher of my faith I've taken you as the author of my faith already and I'm looking at you all the time anything that wants to come between you and I I'm going to push it aside. Anything, anything and everything. Any man, any woman, any relationship, any companionship, any idea, any work that is going to come between you and I, I push that aside. I'm always looking unto Jesus. Any friend that will come between you and Jesus, any relative that will come between you and Jesus, anyone on earth that will come between you and Jesus, you push all that aside, you're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such condition of sinners against himself against himself the pharisees were you know so tricky and they could have distracted jesus the sadducees were so a uh, kind of a uh, boisterous and consistently coming to jesus trying him and testing him they could have distracted jesus but all the contradictions of the sinners he overcame them and he endured everything. I say, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Verse 4, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Look at that verse 4. You strive against sin. You bleach the besetting sin aside. Any other sin may try to come in. And then there are people, they want an easy life. They want a convenient life. And sin is coming, and sinners are coming. And then they say, look at this that is happening now. They cannot resist unto blood. And that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. And I, I need to tell you, 
there are challenges that came. I didn't know God was raising me up to be uh, a leader, a pastor, a preacher of a church like Deep Alive Bible Church. I was just a believer, I was just an ordinary Christian in my own personal private life. And then I went from school to school to such ways I got converted under a militant, determined atheist that wanted everybody under his influence to be like him. But I said no. And I said something you know, that he even made him unhappy. He was so unhappy. I mean, you know, this person I'm talking about, a leader, secular, educationally over me. I had the chance of being in the assembly because we teachers were talk to uh, the children. And I said, students, listen. The principal was there. And then I said, an empty bag cannot stand upright. You can paint the bag, you can do whatever to the bag, an empty bag cannot stand upright. Without God, without grace, without his power, you cannot stand upright. I don't care your principle. I don't care about your motive or believe what you believe. If you're an empty bag, you cannot stand upright. And my principal was there. After that assembly went to write a kind of um, some, a message from the school and distributed to all the children, this is not a religious school, this school is this and that, but I've said what I needed to say. One of my students visited Bagada just about a few months ago, and the one thing he remembered that he has carried out of school all these years, more than 40 years, the one thing I remembered is that I said to the whole school in the presence of the one that says we shouldn't believe in God, an empty bag cannot stand upright. And he has carried that until this day. You see, you need to make up your mind. You will strive until you strive against sin, even if you have to shed your blood. Even if you have to lose everything you've got, you know, you would have thought, I should have thought about the person that employed me. And I shouldn't have said anything that will rock the boat. And I got to university. And in my university days, I concentrated on what I needed to do. I read my maths, but I read my Bible. And then we had a head of department in our university he was for traditional things he was for cultural things and that man was tall a professor tall if you disagreed with him people said you will not take any certificate out of that institution but i was a christian i was a believer and then he said in the class in our final year he said you know you students i'm inviting all of you to come to my house and i have pan wine for you to drink and you will drink and then all our students they looked at where i was sitting they were looking at me they said the man got you today when the final year and if you don't go you know you are not going to have a certificate out of this place is the head of the department he can deal with you whatever he wants and then i didn't say anything of course and he said i want to prepare for you especially i know how many chairs to put there and how many cups and tumblers and whatever to put there and if you are going to come raise up your hand and all the rest of the class raised up their hand, except who? <laughs> except William. By the way, William means a defender of the faith. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But I knew that's my name. I was going to stand. I didn't raise up my hand. And he looked and pointed at me and said, how about you? Are you not coming? I said, no, sir, I'm not coming. He said, why? I said, because 
I'm a born again Christian. He said, what religion is that? I said, no religion, just having Jesus in your heart and living for Jesus. He was angry. He said, that religion will be wiped out away from Nigeria. I stood up and said, sir, that's impossible. And he went to drink the upper wine. And I stayed back. And in a few weeks, we went for the exam. I'm just giving you testimony of what God has done for me. When the result came out, in my department, in my faculty, in the whole university in 1967, I was the first student in the whole university. And the man who wanted me to compromise, drink and wine, and I said, for me, it's not a big deal. I will not. You strive against sin until, even if you want to lose your life, lose certificate, you are ready. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. <laughs> I told you about secondary school. I told you about university. Striving against sin. I came to Unilag for my postgraduate in education and everything was going on until one of the lecturers came and his subject was compulsory if you passed all the other subjects and you failed in his subject you are failed you couldn't carry any certificate out of that place but he welcomed to the class and because he knew it's like he was indispensable it's, it was like his class was special. And the university made that class for postgraduate students compulsory. You must pass that, um, you know, that subject. But he'll come to class and be talking rubbish. He'll talk about women. He'll talk about nightclub. He'll talk about immorality. He'll talk, he was just, you know, just telling the students nonsense. And then I raised up my hand. My, the other students looked at me, they knew I was going to, you know, blow the thing. And uh, when I raised up my hand, he said, yes, what do you have to say? I said, we are adults in this class. We've gone through undergraduate level, this is postgraduate. All this mess you are talking about is not part of the curriculum. We know the curriculum, we know the syllabus. So, I would appeal to you to stop and teach us what you need to teach. So what do you mean? I'm the lecturer. I'm this, I'm that. I said, yes, but we're adults. Don't talk like that to us. All that rubbish. We don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. I am a born again. Somebody tell me. Christian. The man got angry. Nebuchadnezzar can become angry. But I am going to heaven. Somebody there, where are you going? He came to the class. The following time, he had class with us. He didn't prepare any notes to teach. He wanted to show me that I've not seen anything. I've not heard any bad story. I was going to hear real bad story. And he spoke and spoke and spoke. And I knew I couldn't be in that class. I packed my papers, my books. I went out of the class. My ears will not hear rubbish. How about you? My eyes will not see evil. And remember, a subject was compulsory. I went out of that class. If I'm not going to have another certificate, I've got enough, I must keep my salvation. Anybody there? I said, anybody there? You keep your salvation. That month, that lecturer is on record. Had problem with the university, and they sent him away. And then they told us, 
that subject is no more compulsory you want to take it you can take it you don't want to take it because he had set the exam already and he said the class was no more compulsory and so i didn't have to take the subject and i still came out with distinction if you serve the lord if you stand by the lord if you don't care what people say what people think and you say you're going to run the race the lord will support you the lord will promote you and the lord will lift you up in jesus name it's like it says we have not started look at verse 4 of hebrews chapter 12 ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin that's how he wants us to run he wants us to run with all our heart all our soul all our mind leaving nothing behind and not caring what you miss or what you lose everything you think you are going to lose the lord will multiply blessings upon your life in jesus name by looking at some 119 some 119 i'm reading from verse 13. i have chosen the way of truth i have chosen the way of truth it has to be your personal choice you have to make up your mind i'm going to serve the lord and i'm going to run the race that is set before me i have chosen the way of truth thy judgments have i laid before me verse verse 32 i will run the way of thy commandments i will run it's my decision it's my determination it's my destiny this is the choice of god for me i will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart it will do it for you in jesus name point number two reaping the fields and gathering fruits for the savior we're looking at john chapter 4 john chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 34 John chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 34 Jesus says unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work that's Christ and it says we're looking unto Christ the author and the finisher of our faith and it says my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work know the one who has sent you if christ has sent you if god has sent you if the holy ghost has sent you know the one that has sent you and don't you know in the middle of the way abandon or forsake the one who has sent you and then you're looking at that person he has not sent you you're looking at that lady she has not sent you you're looking at that young man he has not sent you know the one who has sent you and make your commitment to the one who has sent you that whatever price you have to pay him, and whatever tunnel or challenges you have to go through he is the one who has sent me and he sent me to go and reap in his field and i'm reaping for the savior look at verse 35 say not ye there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together is talking about our reaching out to souls by the way nobody told me i should reach out to souls by the way i never heard a single message on soul winning i never heard a single message on reaching out and going out to touch people's lives and bringing them into the kingdom of god 
no man, no preacher, no pastor ever taught me from 1964 when I became a believer. They only spoke about holiness, about getting to heaven, and they spoke about ordaining pastors, and the pastors they ordained are the only people that can preach. But then I read it in my Bible. And he spoke to all his disciples. He says, come after me and let the dead bury their dead. But you go preach the kingdom of God. And I picked it up. And then the people who should have encouraged me to do that and to keep on preaching the word, they called me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm preaching the word. I'm evangelizing. I'm telling the people who are sinners to come to the Lord. They say, you can't do that. I said, why? They said their church did not believe in that. Oh, I said, but look at the Bible. Say, uh -uh. don't prove too tough. It's not Bible we're talking of. We're talking of our doctrine in our church. Oh, I said, I'm out of that. And that's the reason why they had a problem with me and sent me away from their church. But I said, whatever the consequence, I'm going to stand on what I read from the Bible. He sent me, and he sent me to you, and thank God you have come. Yeah. And I pass it on to you. Yeah. You will serve the Lord. Yeah. This, is serving the, this is serving the Lord. And I went to different places. And I, you know, as we were went in evangelism, we, you know, we slept on the bare ground, and we ate the ordinary food, and we didn't even, we, I even went into a public transport and I went to different parts of the country preaching the word of God because he sent me and you know the one that sent you and later deeper life now you know organize things and everything and now we have this we have this now we can you know use aeroplane we can use cars all those things were not there at that time but I said aeroplane or no aeroplane I will do what God has commanded you will do what God has commanded. And you will not be tired. I said you will not be tired. Look at verse 37. Herein is a saying true. One sows and another reapeth. I sent you. Thank God he sent me. I about you. Thank God he sent me. I said thank God he sent me. Now, what if I folded my hands? What if I sat down? What if I did nothing? What if I was waiting for somebody to tell me, okay, you're a worker now, come and do this, come and do that. What if I waited in the way they wanted me to wait and concentrate on something that the New Testament does not emphasize? And then I abandoned the work he sent me to do. And that's what you're doing. You've heard over and over, but you're folding your hand. You've heard over and over, but you're sitting down. You have heard over and over, but you're not doing it. You're trying to see what will I gain, what will I lose, and all that. You're too much attached to religious personalities and so in this your life you cannot lay your life on the altar and say Lord I'm going to serve you you will serve the Lord I sent you to reap that whereon he bestowed no labor other men labored and ye are entered into their labors point Number two is what we're looking at, reaping the fields and gathering fruit for the Savior. You'll gather fruit for the Savior. First Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That was the mind in which I went out, in which I preached the word, in which I knew 
my life is just for one thing and these are the mind god wants you to have that your mind your heart is made for this one thing and you're able to say that necessity is laid upon you ye woe is unto you if you preach not the gospel you didn't say amen to that one for if i do this sin willingly if i do this sin willingly i have a reward but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me what is my reward then verily that when i preach the gospel i may make the gospel of christ without charge that i abuse not my power in the gospel then it says for though i be free from all men yet have i made myself servant unto all that i might gain the more i made myself servant unto all that i may win them reach them convert them turn them to christ gain them for christ unto the jews i became as a jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law what he's saying is I give up my freedom I give up my likes and dislikes I give up my favorite ideas I gave up my own comfort and convenience and then I went to the midst of the people the Lord wants me to bring the word of salvation to verse 21 to them that are without law as without law being not without law to God but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law to the weak became i as weak i made myself available even to do so weak when he said weak he wasn't talking about a weak in their body talking about they were weak in their understanding i'll not eat this i'll eat only herbs i'll eat only you know this and that i'll eat only fish i don't eat meat they were weak in that area and he says to the weak i became as weak that i might gain the weak i made my i made i am made all things to all men personally voluntarily I submit, I subject myself, I surrender myself. I'm available for service. It says I've made myself, I've made all things to all men that I, that I might by all means save some. The Lord will help you. Luke chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, we're looking at verse 10. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 it says in verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost and now he passed that to his own disciples to all of us verse 12 he said therefore a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, what did he say? Was he telling you? What are you going to do? occupy till i come point number three now reaching forth towards the fullness of a stature reaching forth towards the fullness of his stature what's your own understanding of your calling look at ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 reading from verse 12 and it says for the perfecting of the saints the reason you came to the retreat is so that 
you will not remain at the level you have been. Maybe you've been a Christian, a believer, a born again believer before you came. But the retreat is to move you forward, is for the perfecting of the saints. Number one is to make you a saint, not a whitewashed sinner. To make you a saint, and then it is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. The reason the retreat came and the reason you have come is so you can be part of the work of his ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come. How many of us? Tell me out aloud. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. You know there are people that say that's him I cannot be like that. Look at this again. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. He stood for the faith. He standing for the faith. He defending the faith. He supporting the faith. He spreading the faith. That's him. That's him. I'm not like that. Why are you not like that? Till we all come in the unity of the faith. He has told us some of the stories of his life how he stood for the faith and he didn't care what he would lose by standing up for the faith that's him i cannot be like that why not till we all come in the unity of the faith he's still standing at his age he's not slowing down he's not drawing back and he's still as firm as he was before I wish I could be like that, but I am not. Why are you not like that? Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Well, he is a man, and I'm a woman. What do you mean? Is it being a man, natural strength that has brought me to that? Or is it the conviction inside my heart? Is it the experience inside my heart? Is it the prayer that I prayed? Is it how I knelt on a private altar in my own house? And then I wield my life, my time, my skill, everything I've got, I wield it to the Lord. Is it not a hard experience? What are you saying? Because I'm a woman. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto what kind of a man? I can't hear you. Unto, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's our calling. That's our calling. That's what He wants us to be. He wants us to look at the fullness of the stature of Christ and then to press on. And to say, I want to be like him. Much water has gone under the bridge. Much time has been wasted. And much has been lost. But now from today until I see him face to face, I want to strive. I want to endeavor. I want to consecrate. I want to commit my life until I attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Lord will do it in your life. Amen. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Not as though I had already attained either were already perfect is saying i've got much but i've not got all i've attained much i've not attained all i've reached out some i've not reached out fully not as though i'd already attained either were already perfect but i follow after every day I want this day to add something new to my commitment, something new to my consecration, something new to my dedication, something new to my backbone, something new to my conviction, my, my conscious courage, something new to my fearlessness. It says, I follow after. 
if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Every day, this one thing I do. I want to look unto Jesus more. I want to shed all the weight that might put me down. I want to shed more weight. And I want to have all the things attached to my life. I want to be detached from them so I can be free to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to strive against sin. I want to win more souls. I want to reach out to more people. I want to deepen the experience and the consciousness of holiness in my life, in my heart. There is one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God. God in Christ Jesus. I press on. I press on. I press on. You will press on. You will not look back. You will not say, I've done enough. You have not done anything. You are just about to start. I said, You are just about to start. And now, no looking back. Now, no slacking. Now, no giving up. Now, no fear. But you are reaching out and you are going to make it in Jesus' name. You are going to be stronger than you have ever been. You are going to be more courageous than you have ever been. You are going to fight the good fight of faith like you have never fought in Jesus' name. You are going to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints like you have never done in Jesus' name. Some of the friends you have now might think the fire of revival in your soul and the fire of zeal that is burning now, they say is getting too much for them. Some of those friends will leave you by themselves. Goodbye, good readers. Goodbye, good readers. That is, any friend that will not take you as your arm that will not accept you, that you are keeping, you are not giving yourself fully to the Lord, and they say, he is too hot for them, and he is too serious for them, he is too zealous for the Lord for them, and they say they want to leave you, bye-bye, I've chosen to follow Jesus. Anybody there? Bye-bye, I've chosen to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. The friends may oppose me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I know the Lord is preparing another place for me. And by all means, I'm going to be there. No turning back, no turning back. Any spirit, any weakness inside you there that will make you to consider turning back, the Lord cast it out in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. The last verse there, verse 18. But we all, how many people? How many people, uh, you know, the, the idea of some people, they say, you know, in a church, there'll be those who are serious, there'll be those who are not serious. Is that the will of God? But we all, you see, there are some, they say, there are those who are going to take the word, hook, line, and sinker. There are those who may not totally take the word like but well together, no, but we all. They say there are those who are going to be on fire for the Lord, revived, and they're quickened, and they're serving the Lord, and they're running the race, and nothing will deter them. Then they say, but there are other people that are not going to be so strong, and are going to slack back a little. Why should be, will it be you that will slack back a little? It says in verse 18, tell me what you read in verse 18. 
Are you there? Tell me what you read in verse 18. Say that again. But we all with open face beholding as in a mirror, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. We all are changed. We all are changed. The men and the women, we all are changed. The old timers and the newcomers, we all are changed. Those who are aged and those who are still young with physical energy, we all are changed. Those who have been here for a long time, those who have just come and they're hearing this message of life, we all are changed into the same image. We all are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. A change has now come. We are going into the new year with a new zeal with a new power, with a new courage, with, with a new militancy in Jesus' name. All the things that confronted you before and you were coward and you almost fell, those things may still come, you will stand. There's an army of soldiers going out of this camp every wall of jericho will fall before you every demon will run away before you every sickness will be healed by the word of your mouth you will stand we're going to all the villages and all the towns and all the hamlets and all the schools and all the hospitals and all the prisons everywhere in this land everywhere in every country and as we go Satan will fall. Demons will fall. Powers of darkness will fall. The gospel will be preached. And the captives of Satan will be delivered, released from the hands of those holding them in captivity in Jesus' name. As you go, there's a wall of fire around you. Watch cannot touch me will not touch you what cannot weaken me will not weaken you what cannot confront me will not confront you like father like children i keep standing you'll keep standing you will be changed i said you'll be changed a new life a new vigor a new zeal, a new power, a new authority, a new boldness, a new courage. You are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Rise up and receive something new. Rise up and receive a new power a new courage, a new understanding, a new zeal, a new fire, revival in your soul, revival in your soul, determination in your life, determination in your life. Nothing will bend you. Nothing will bow you down. Nothing will conquer you. Every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon, the Lord has given unto you. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl, no gang, no culture group will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. I see it was with Moses, I see it was with Joshua, I see it was with um, Daniel, I see it was with Joseph, it will be with you. It was with Stephen. It was with Peter, it was with Philip, it was with them as they went out, he will be with you. The Pharisees will surrender, the Sadducees will surrender, all those Gentiles, they will surrender. You keep on standing and then you say, I will run, I will run, I will run. You will run, you will not be tired, you will walk, you will not faint. You'll reach out, you'll reach out, you'll reach out to the fields and then you will reach forth towards the fullness of the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not fail. A new day has come and a new strength has come to you. Stand, walk and run.